what I'm presenting today is basically mostly done by Gregory Bogrand. And he's working on Arctic now. I promised me some slides, but I'm still waiting for them. So right now I'm gonna present a paper that was came out uh, in, um, in global, in natural climate change recently. And uh, this paper, um, this paper is, we think an important paper, but I have to tell that the metal theory is Gregory's and the modelization is his. And so you say, why I'm here? Good question. I'm here because uh, I, when I was a Marie Curie fellow at, um, at um, Safos, I edited a special issue on regime shifts and we started the col this collaboration and put together the, the collaboration from which we had the first publication and that's the follow up. So I'm, I'm here for a reason. I just want to quickly mention that we often call regime shifts and abrupt shift together. And so regime shifts are large, of, often abrupt changes, uh, which and compass multiple variables and can be persistent if I cross a tipping point and if I go in alternative states. We've seen regime shifts often in benthic communities like in, um, um, in coral reefs and in temperate reefs and we often call, we often in the climate we have seen lots of regime shifts. In pelagic ecology, however, this is a more, more, more difficult to, say, to state. So we call them abrupt shifts, um, at least Gregory does. Uh, so, it's, so if you find abrupt shift is mostly meaning that uh, they are in pelagic ecology where actually you cannot, first you'll measure the same things over and over, and second, uh, we can not so often really say there is this, an alternative state one or an alternative state two, but you can find a big variation in the community, which are often indicated by big variation in the um, abundance uh, or in the biodiversity. So having given this little definition, we can say that they have been found in all marine habitats, like um, tropical coral reefs, temperate reefs, and in pelagic environment, in all marine basins in, for which there are uh, long-term series. We have been also found in luminology, in lake, for example, the classical lake shifting from clear to turbid, and in terrestrial, like desertification with our original story. So they are ubiquitous. And in fact, they have been found um, in several uh, habitats, basically wherever we have time series. So they matter not only from ecological point of view, because we often see uh, that a species that was dominant has disappeared or and is replaced by other species, but they also have huge economical, can have huge economical impact. Um, so they can affect uh, the, all the ecosystem services from tourism and cultural services. Um, they can affect nursery ground, they can affect the fisheries and the biodiversity. So because of this, um, there are a lot of interest to managers and scientists and social scientists alike. Um, so what are the, uh, the stressors I'm mentioning here, the stressor related to climate change, uh, because um, there are also lots of other type of anthropogenic stressors, not only related to climate change. And so everything which is related to global change um, from extreme events, temperature increase, which also affects oxygen reduction, uh, for the acidification is up, happening in the ocean because of increased CO2. The atmospheric and circulation changes because of increasing temperature. All of these uh, affect, uh, can uh, make species shifts um, that are, and also invasive species can arrive because of 
transport and circulation. And all of these um, can result in a gene shifts. And because uh, very we, we progress with uh, warmer scenarios, we think there will be more regime shifts. So, um, so predictions. So can we predict regime shift and abrupt shift? I will use them more in um, one for the other, um, but you know the difference. And will the shift increase our, as global warming goes on? So there is the method theory by Gregory, which is the one I'm mentioning now, um, which is the prediction of unprecedented biological shift in, in the global ocean. So to be correct, the meteor theory is applied for this study. It's been applied for other studies as well. And the, here we use a single driver of the one I mentioned before, which is temperature. And uh, Metal means macroecological theory on the arrangement of life. And is a theory that explains the organization basically of life through the, um, through the concept of ecological um, niche. Because uh, the ecological niche of species and the species arranged in a community is impacted by, for example, climate change, so there is a response. So that's the theory. And so how was it applied here? Um, Metal proposes that the abrupt shift result from the interaction between climate-induced environmental changes and the niches. Um, so there is no need for attractors and only a single parameter is used so far, which is temperature. And so synthetic species are created, they are called pseudospecies, and each has a unique Gaussian thermal niche, which has distinct degrees of eurothermy, so they can be stenothermic from 1.1 1, 1 .1 degrees of tolerance to 10 degrees Celsius, and uh, by increments, and also have a different degree of thermophily. So some prefer colder water from minus 1.8, so Arctic, Arctic, Arctic waters, and uh, and so and go and so and, and they go up to 40 Celsius. Also, this pseudo species goes to by 0.1 degree increments. So they are randomly chosen, um, no, sorry. So they, these pseudo species, 20,000 of them, populate the world ocean. And they are, uh, can say there, if they can survive the, um, the co ocean condition, which are uh, made by a monthly SST, actually measured by codes. So, and then pseudo species are randomly chosen to create local pseudo communities. And so uh, that is how it works in how they are created. And so in this work, um, in Nature Climate Change, we, com we wanted to see uh, how the prediction of abrupt uh, shift would be using pseudo species versus observations. So we had um, 14 areas for which we had um, this. Can you see my mouse? Well, I guess yes. Yes, we can. We had 14, 14 areas in which we had observed long term, time, long term time series, 40 years or more. And these are the observed communities. And um, so these 14 areas, uh, we compared with in the same area the pseudo communities and the first test were area by area each area were observed communities versus predicted in gray and these are the resulting so the resulting simulations this is as example i use antarctic i use antarctic because we had long, an observed long time series there and so i cannot use arctic but maybe this is a little bit of interest so this is um, um, 
the red is the observed and the gray are 10,000 simulation and they are uh, pretty good. Um, the second test, are, so these are, sorry, these are, um, um, these are principal component. The second test uses global, um, it's on a global scale. So now these are averaged over uh, these 14 areas and also the equivalent uh, uh, predicted communities are averaged, averaged, averaged over the same areas. Um, what I want to mention is that predicted here means predicted by metal. These are not forecasts in the future as of yet. These are um, simulated, um, I could say. So if you hear predicted, I uh, think predicted by metal. So here we have the, um, uh, in red again, the principal, first principal component combined over the 14 areas. In blue are um, 10,000 first principal component over, combined over the 14 areas. And in green are um, 10,000 null mod random models. So we can say that at least it predicts better than random time series. Actually, we can say that predicts pretty well. So the third test was a group shift. So we now um, Gregory use a a um, a blue shift detect, uh, detection algorithm that he himself made. And this is again combined over 14 areas, the uh, red, which is the predicted, uh, the observed, the blue are the metal predictions and the green are the random models. And again, are remarkably good. So because they are good, we felt confident in using metal in areas without observed time series. So then what we could find interesting because now the Arctic is included. So now there's prediction only. We're not using um, principal components again and right now, but just the pseudospecies abundance. And what was found in this um, work was that the number of shifts and the spatial extents increased over time and reached the maximum in 2010-14, which is the last uh, period we use for this uh, subset of study. And what's the title of the paper? I have to also explain that this paper is basically uh, what I'm trying to explain, uh, so maybe it's not. Um, um, it's a bit big. This paper is basically a combination of five papers. Each test could have been a paper and has 200 pages of supporting information. So it's a, it's a big paper, very interesting. So I can only explain a fraction of it. And also, uh, so, so at when we compared the global um, shifts of the predicted series all over the world, we noticed the change in time, in, in over time, in spatial extent, which suggests that we can, which suggests that we, uh, with climate change, there will be more, basically. So now I'm just going to quickly show from 2007. If you even just look over this area, this is only prediction. We have no observations for here, or at least not long time series. We cannot test on this area, but we can see. You can see how it changes over time. So we go 2007, 10, 8, 11, and 2009, 12, 10, 13. 11, 14, 12, 15, and so that was the last one. And 
And this is the area which overall showed more shifts um, in the time series. So concluding key points, in observed time series we've seen uh, ubiquitous, uh, they, they have been found at certain points in all habitats and in all basins where time series exist. And synchronous, shifts in the same years in several ocean basins. I did not really have the time to show this. Um, but basically there are years like 76, 77, so they've shown up. Uh, 88 was another big year. And, um, and so they've been shown. And with the global simulation, um, shift to course over all over the globe at certain times, but um, um, they cover a little bit of the ocean at all times. But unprecedented magnitude and spatial extent in the last period studied, 2010 and 14. And what is novel is the metal prediction can be used in areas without observation in addition to monitoring programs. We think, uh, we believe it is possible. So what is actually Gregory doing is actually working on the Arctic. You see a very interesting results. And that was the plan to present today, but it's gonna become a presentation part two because I don't have this light. And so as we move with climate change and we can see that multiple um, future interacting climate tipping points converge, uh, regime shifts are always gonna be more important and, are go and can have more and more um, economic implications. So, well, that's the end. Thank you. And I thought I had Gregory somewhere, but I don't find it. So, but I can somewhere, there is a metal theory um, link again. Okay, I'm Thank done. you. And what Thank I'm, you, Alessandra. And Thank I like you so much. Time, time. <laughs> what time it is? I, I like to know if I'm time. In time. Uh, it, it, you you did great, Alessandra. It's uh, it was just a 15, 20 minutes. I want to uh, clarify um, for those who joined uh, later. Um, the original presentation that Alessandra was going to give us was Arctic only. It was Pan Arctic, but there was a problem with the slides. So we decided to today to have part one global scale, and at the later date we're going to have a part two, which is going to be pan Arctic. So this was a sort of introduction to um, the methodology, uh, especially the metal uh, approach or the metal model, and um, and we will try to get um, the second part, which is Arctic uh, specific. Um, later in the in the calendar year. Uh, are there any questions for Alessandra? Yeah, this is Francis. I have a question. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, hi Alessandra. Uh, thank you very much hi. for the presentation. Um, I, I I guess my questions are about the model setup. Do you in does the model allow for a spatial shift to another thermal preference, or is it just in changes within one place? And, uh, and then when you set up the pseudo species and you have the Gaussian distribution of their temperature preferences, did you vary the width of the distribution or are they all the same? So can we look at whether different width of thermal preferences are gonna be reacting differently as one might expect, or are they all treated equally? Okay. You have two questions, right? Yes. Um, I've not done the model, so I will try to to answer it. But may I may not be able to. Um, the, um, but I can find these slides how so the species are created because it's a hidden slide. Where? I think I have it. No, 
was kommt ab zu bevor wir wieder aufgenommen haben. Let me look for one more second. I found this other one. I cancelled it. Hey. No, I cancelled the, the slide that I wanted to show. So anyway, I thought I, I had it hidden, but it's not here. And I cannot really go and retrieve it now. Um, the request um, in the model, uh, pseudo species are created on the basis of their, um, they have a ther thermal optimum and they have a range. So, and these are created in big numbers and then they go and populate the ocean. So we cannot say no, but the ones who don't have a, the ones whose thermal parameters are not appropriate. So, for example, are still terms and they are in an area which big changes of temperature, they don't survive there. And so the others who have a thermal optimum, not right. So uh, the one that are warmer species will not survive in the, will not survive in the Arctic waters. And these, but these are mathematical simulation, of course. Okay, let me look for the slide that I'm, so is this the question you, you did? You yes. wanted to answer? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and maybe I can follow up by email too. So basically you're saying it does not, it, they can't, they don't shift geographically. Basically if where they are supposed to be, the temperature regime changes to be outside of their optimum, they, right. di they disappear. In, the, in this application, the shift that you see are over time. I'm quite yes. sure a geographic application can be made, but in this one, they are not. They just, uh, they just uh, don't survive. Yeah, yeah. And and the, the the shape of the curve of each individual optimum. I mean, their optimum is at a different place, but the shape of the curve is is the same for each of the species. No, some of them have a narrow shape and some okay. of them have a wide shape. Okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I have Thank a, you. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, the Darwin model um, is uh, based on the same principle, at least the original Darwin model that was um, a Gaussian representation and a random selection uh, based on, on temperature uh, range. Uh, did you uh, compare your your shift uh, or the, the evolution of the shift uh, with uh, the Darwin model? I did not and Gregory might but I cannot answer for him because uh, he has worked a lot on the theory and studied a lot of it um, and studied, compared it to other models, uh, but I have not done it, so I cannot really answer to this one. Thank you. I'm a, a, I'm collaborator for this specific global regime shift application. The metal theory is much, actually, is, is much bigger than this application has been used for single species um, and for other type of predictions. So not only abrupt shift is just one, one type of, of prediction. But if you go to this, um, to the metal theory site, it's um, lots of explanations are there. One second. So it's here. Um, lots of because Gregory has basically written a whole book 
on um, on the biology in the ocean. So he has put a huge quantity of work, and but on this site, and then he has reached the conclusion that temperature was a major major predictor, and and the interaction with the nature of the species could explain how the life is arranged. And a lot of this is explained here. So which I could in this site. Um, which I can quickly. I've just stuck it in the chat box for everyone. Oh, cool. Well, I also put in showing it here. Oh, that's good. So the basic behind it is all here, but at the species level, the references, um, and not only, but Gregory is very willing to work with everybody who wants to use it for another type of test. Problem is, so many people are have asked that he's so busy when he doesn't answer to me. <laughs> so it's not that easy. But um, he's really interested in uh, testing the, the metal theory and the species he creates on global or regional questions. So he, I think that, that I asked him to be here in this meeting actually to do the talk himself originally. But he told me that he's too busy until the sun next fall or so. And, uh, but uh, if you have questions related to ecosystems and you want to use the theory, in, I'm sure he's interested. Maybe you want to look at this. Well, too long. <laughs> this is too long for here. <laughs> but I encourage to to check it out. Are, are there any other questions for Alessandra? Yeah, this is Will. I've, I've got a question. So if I understand this, um, this is all based on uh, thermal tolerances and that you've, you've defined the species um, and how they'll respond simply based on their their, their thermal response. Um, but we know that ecosystems and communities um, are also driven by species interactions. So are you suggesting that we don't need to know about species interactions anymore to make predictions of regime shifts? Or is it your plan to um, at some point include um, species interactions and um, keystone species, et cetera, uh, to refine this model? Because if it's the former, um, that puts an entire branch of ecology uh, out of business. Um, uh, and if it's the latter, I'd be interested in, in how you think you might go about that. Okay. Um, in, with regard to the question of abrupt shifts, the basic idea is that if a key species of the key system is impacted, the whole community has a shift. So that can be for the bioconstructors, or can be for the top predators, or can be for the main uh, food for the fishery there. So if, um, so if there is a community in which um, that spe some species are, are central, they can get a shift while other communities even if there is a similar warming, do not experience shift. So in this sense, sometimes um, the species in, so um, a species, so a perma, a, now we're talking of self communities, um, a community which has a, a species, which has a thermal tolerance, which is already borderline, and then the temperature increases or increases again to the point that the species cannot survive, then that community, uh, then that species may have um, a decline or a collapse and can result in a community shift in which the species interaction is of course very important. 
um, uh, because the whole community is interacting with the species and is shifting. But uh, the but the but the thermal impact on the, on the key species is the one who uh, starts the shift or causes or basically pushes the whole community to the brink. So I don't know if I answered exactly, but what I am trying to say is that um, with uh, thermal, uh, with a good understanding of thermal in interaction, you can uh, simulate what happens in communities in which anyway, the species interaction are uh, extremely, not only extremely relevant, but it's, um, essential. Uh, okay, thanks. I'll, I'll take a look at the, uh, the web page too. Thanks. Any other questions before we go to the next uh, agenda item? Thank you, Alessandra. Um, thank you once more. And uh, we look forward to have a part uh, two for the work on the Arctic that Gregory and you are doing. Um, thank you. Thank you once more. You're welcome and thank you for inviting. Bye. So the next uh, agenda item is um, member updates and in this part of the um, call we invite uh, all members to share uh, announcements, findings, um, cruise reports, uh, anything you want to share with the group or uh, suggestions also for uh, presentations uh, as they are connected uh, hopefully to the five-year plan. Um, anyone has any updates? Uh, this is Jackie. I'll just update you briefly. We had uh, we had the Arctic Science Summit week in uh, Russia, and I would say that we had discussions between the uh, countries involved in the Pacific Arctic Group, and we will have a fall meeting in China for that. But I did want to mention I did have presentations both in uh, St. Petersburg with the uh, Otto Schmidt Laboratory with the Germans and Russians, and then went on to the Shirshov Institute in Moscow, where I got a very open presentation, but also collaborations building for getting information on the Karolaptev and the East Siberian Sea that are trying to connect into the Synoptic Arctic Survey. So there'll be more information coming from that. Uh, the second thing, there is an ARICE, which is where it's a call for using ship time on uh, from other countries. Um, it is, there's a web page that I'll put on if it's not already there on the MECT site, but basically there's, you can put in requests for the three vessels, the Seneca, the Kropens, the Norwegian Haken, and the uh, Swedish Odin ship for ship access. So that is open to the community with a deadline of the 3rd of July. Thank you, Jackie. Um, bring us uh, any updates as they develop uh, uh, for the July and August uh, calls, please. Uh, any any sure. other updates? Oh, yeah. nobody else is going to. There is a mass mortality go, uh, event going on with gray whales uh, on the Pacific coast and moving, and we'll find out more in Alaska. But Kathy Kulitz also sees there's uh, die, large flocks of dying seabirds that they might be related to harmful algal bloom, HABs activity up in the Alaskan sector. So. There are, uh, they're asking cruises, and we're gonna ask this with gray whales also, that any chief scientist, any crews going up into the North Pacific, into the Arctic, uh, take pictures and notify, make records of any of the, uh, this is not just one or two birds or one or two whales, it's over 100 gray whales have died now. So uh, there's so there's two of these more uh, high incidences going on as we speak, and uh, so this is information that'll come out further throughout the summer, but 
we're asking for all ships that going up to keep their eyes out on that. Oh, thank you, um, Jackie, for mentioning that. Um, I'm going to check the um, Leo Network uh, website to find out if there are any last uh, minute images. That's a good uh, resource, uh, especially because they have a sort of um, scientific uh, filtering of the information and validation and so on. Um, thanks for uh, mentioning this. Any any other updates, announcements? Oh, this is Danielle Dixon. I just wanted to update the team and let you know that we had a really great uh, team leaders workshop with IARPIC last month, and we're working right now on finalizing the plan for our webinars for the coming nine months or so. So um, we've, we've got a great lineup for you, and we'll tell you more about that on the call next month. And, and thank you, Danielle, for uh, reminding us. Um, that's a, this is a good time then to suggest any potential speakers or uh, offer yourself as a potential speaker for for this uh, collaboration team, um, as long as um, one of the performance elements at least is being addressed, um, there shouldn't be any problem in accommodating um, additional presentations to the one that, to the ones that we already discussed with uh, Jackie and, and Daniel. So you, you can do that, you can mention that now or via email uh, if you have a, a suggested uh, um, speaker. Any other um, comments, questions, updates? Uh, this is Jackie again. I'll just go ahead and say that Arctic Frontiers 2050, the uh, deadline for early registration is in July. That's the meeting in September on, you know, futures and policy. It'll be at the National Academies. And then Ocean Ops, the one meeting in uh, Hawaii, they've extended their poster to the 27th of uh, this month. So if anybody wanted to submit a poster or go to that meeting on that is held every 10 years, that's a deadline coming up in two days. Yeah, yeah, the registration goes up after July 10th, I guess, if I remember right. So it, it doubles. Right. So uh, if you're planning to register, uh, remember that. And there was someone else who was about um, to speak uh, when Jackie started um, announcing the Arctic Futures Conference. Oh, that was that was just me, Guillermo. This is Danielle. Um, I wanted to mention because I see we've got um, a couple of people who were on the line when we did our two-part series on uh, integration between observations and models that are on the phone again. And I wanted to let you know we do have plans to follow up with uh, some more joint calls with the modeling team to continue that conversation. So keep an eye on our agendas. I think some of you will be very interested in, in what will be coming next. Good point, good point. Thank you, Daniel. Any last minute um, announcements, updates before we adjourn? If not, our next uh, meeting is going to be July, help me out, uh, Mary. 24th. 24th. It's on the screen. <laughs> uh, so I'll, uh, we will talk to you on July 24th. And if you have any afterthoughts after today's call, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to Jackie, Danielle, or me um, via email. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.